Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Ward, and this is Look Who's Stalking. On this podcast, I'll take you through the most tragic stalking cases of our time. Ex-lovers, secret obsessions, friendships turned sour, and then unravel the motives of each stalker and outline how you can spot the telltale signs of a potential stalker. Throughout my time as a neurocriminologist, I've studied and interviewed some of the worst criminals and predators in the world. And with this podcast, I hope to prevent others from falling victim to crimes of obsession. Stalking is something we don't always recognize for what it is. In fact, we have this strange habit of interpreting stalking behaviors as cute or sweet or wildly romantic. After all, Stan has just been added to the dictionary as a verb to describe a superfan's dedication. And people throw it around all the time. But that term is pulled directly from Eminem's song Stan, which is about an overly obsessed, stalkerish superfan who ends up taking out his rage by enacting a murder-suicide. But sure, keep saying, I stan Beyonce. It's adorable and not at all creepy. Or the police has hit every breath you take, which I'm pretty sure has been the most played pop song ever. It's too often viewed as a romantic song because we live in a culture where saying you belong to me is thought of as a swoon-worthy thing to say. Seriously, Sting himself said, the song is about a jealous lover. It's not what you think. And yet people play that song at their weddings. But stalking is nothing to scoff at. It's a persistent, unwanted pursuit of an individual by another that evokes fear in the person. At its most harmless, it's annoying. And when it's at its worst, it's life-threatening. But even a harmless and annoying behavior, such as bombarding a victim with gifts in certain contexts, could be the first step in a series of escalating incidents that get progressively worse over time. Because intrusive, obsessive behaviors that can be masked with romance can sometimes be quite dangerous, and at the very least, they are a red flag. On this show, we'll be looking back on a series of tragic stalking cases in the hopes of learning from them and preventing this behavior from taking its full deadly course in the future. I'm a neurocriminologist who has studied some of the worst criminals and predators around. Let's hope that by sharing these stories, it leads to more survivor stories and fewer tragedies. I'm Dr. Michelle Ward, and this is The Stalker Right Behind You. Stalkers don't typically begin their toxic pursuit at the obvious 100% level you might be envisioning. Usually their behaviors escalate over time and they begin quite small. It's kind of like that metaphor about a frog in tepid water. If the water isn't boiling to start, the frog might not sense the danger as the water heats up. Unbeknownst to the frog, he's being cooked. Similarly, stalking victims don't see the red flags and dangers until it's often too late. But just to give you an idea of what to look for, I want to mention a few dangerous behaviors that are common among stalkers. One, of course, they follow and they watch their victim. Yes, that goes without saying, but sometimes it's like on a jogging route or on your way to work, somewhere you're not thinking, you're in your routine and you're not expecting to be watched or followed. That's usually how it starts, especially for stalkers a stranger. Two, trespassing or being present near the victim's home or workplace. As they get more brazen, they come closer to you. So an anonymous stalker or even an ex-boyfriend stalker, they watch you from afar, but if they don't get caught, they come closer and closer to where you live and work. Stealing or vandalizing mail or property of the victim. Now, sometimes that's because they wanna know who you're talking to and what you're doing and what kind of bills you're getting. They might steal your credit card bill to see where you've been going. But other times it's just kind of to like up the ante a little bit, to interact a little bit more closely with their victim. Initiating unwanted contact or communication through deliveries, telephone calls, texts, email, or any other medium to the victim and his or her family, neighbors, or coworkers. And that's where it gets creepy, but it's also good because it alerts your family and your friends. Of course, you don't want them pestered by your stalker, but actually the more people who have an eye that keeping their eyes on a potential stalker, the better. And that will go into some advice that I give later. Using digital or video cameras, GPS systems, and other tracking devices. Stalkers do this. 
I mean, we walk around with, you know, basically a stalking device in our phone. Sometimes they hack that, but I have known many, many stalkers, more than you'd think, who've put GPS tracking devices on their victims' cars. And like, how easy is that? They just follow them from their phone. Monitoring the victim's internet history and computer usage. No, to do that, they have to either live with you or they have to hack you. And my favorite, cyber stalking. Don't we all kind of become amateur stalkers via the internet? Okay, I would love a show of hands of, and I'm myself included, who have never looked up their ex-boyfriend, ex-partner, or who your ex is dating. That's my personal favorite. No, but it's true. We're all kind of, I mean, I do it. I hate to admit, and I'm like, psycho about it. I'll look up who I'm dating's ex-girlfriends from before me and get mad about it. Like, I, like that's a thing? Like, that's okay? Here's the thing. It also makes us understand the brain of a stalker better because when we get all obsessive like that and totally normal mental healthy people would, if we can get triggered, could you imagine what a stalker goes through when they have access to your social media? And we'll get into that because honestly, the second you get a stalker, you have to erase your social media presence and young girls don't want to do that. It's like getting rid of your social life. You know, you could see why people are like, I don't think so. Stalk me all you want, dude. But stalkers can become murderers really, really quickly. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So today we're going to be talking about Katie Sosi. She was born in 1982 and she was the oldest of three girls in the town of Auburn, New York. As anyone in her family would tell you, she was awesome. Katie was kind, responsible, and had a thousand friends. After graduating from high school, Katie studied nursing at Cayuga Community College, and she graduated in 2003. She then started working as a traveling nurse doing short contracts at various hospitals, which is kind of a really popular thing for a young nurse without a family to do. While she was assigned to a hospital in Rochester, Katie met David McNamara, and he was an attractive fellow nurse. He was six years older than her. David was engaged at the time, but Katie quickly began a friendship with both David and his fiance. In 2004, Katie worked in California for a time and her job allowed her to travel a lot. So she decided to take advantage and move to a new place. She was out there for about two years, but she stayed in touch with her family and David McNamara the whole time. By the time she decided to move back home, David was single again. So with nothing holding him back, David swooped in to pick up Katie from the airport once she got back. And poof, suddenly David and Katie were in a relationship. Within a couple months, Katie moved into David's place in Rochester, New York. Okay, I want to stop here for a second because while that sounds all fairy tale esque there is actually a red flag there. And anytime somebody speeds up the cadence of a relationship, like you're moving in really quickly or they want to call you a girlfriend right away or love bombing you. It's super romantic and it feels great at the moment. And sometimes it's nothing, but it can be a red flag. So I always say like, look, if you're being love bombed within a couple of weeks, doesn't mean this isn't the one, but just keep your, keep your guard up a little bit, be vigilant because while not all love bombing and moving in quickly ends up in a stalking situation, almost all romantic stalking situations started out like that. Love bombing is when you're in the beginning of a relationship and you feel all of those like butterflies, all those oxytocin feelings, and you're like, I love this guy, I love he's the one, he's the one, but you know better than to say it. You know that like you're gonna sound creepy if on date two you say I love you. But there are people who do it. They literally just say it, what they're feeling. They say it really quickly. Sometimes you feel pressure to say it back. But it's that kind of incessant early stage. I love you. I love you. I love you. Every sentence is I love you. I, I need you. I want you. And those are all great things to hear at the appropriate time. Um, they're great to hear really at any time. But they can be a red flag if they're said really early. And also, if you're not saying it back, you can feel sometimes almost an urgency or an obsessiveness to the way it's being delivered. And I guess that's why it's called bombing. They're just overloading you with these affectionate terms that, yes, they want to be with you all the time. And that's not the normal pattern you'd see in when you just start dating somebody, somebody who's saying they need you, saying they want you, starting to, to ask everywhere you're going at every time of the day and wanting to not share your time with anyone else. They want to know what time you're coming home from work because they want to meet you. And if you have plans, they get a little annoyed. That's like the love bombing. It's almost like a possessiveness early on. Love bombing, once you're in a committed, solid relationship with some 
history behind you is different. That's, you know, I've, they say after 18 months is when you truly know your real feelings for someone because the oxytocin has kind of faded away a bit. I mean, you still get it back, but anyone who's kind of acting like you guys are in a full-blown committed marriage type relationship early on is probably a love bomber. Could be nothing. You know, sometimes those relationships end up becoming beautiful marriages. It just, the bad stalking type, romantic stalkers kind of always start that way. All right, so that's the first little red flag. She has no reason to suspect that as being a red flag. But of course, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Anything that's rushed like that always gives me pause. Rochester was an hour away from Katie's hometown of Auburn, and the distance allowed David to have Katie all to himself for a bit, which, like we suspected, he seemed to enjoy. Pretty quickly, the couple started spending all of their time together. But in February of 2007, David was caught stealing narcotics at work, and he temporarily lost his RN license. And that was how Katie learned about his addiction. David struggled to kick his drug problem, but Katie didn't give up on him. Around Christmas 2008, the couple became engaged, despite the drug problem. So obviously, drug addiction is another red flag. It doesn't mean the person's going to become a stalker, but it indicates the person might have some issues. He's deceptive at, you know, at its best. And it's also, of course, like, you know, there are functioning people who can hide their addictions well, but usually if you're an addict, you become a little flaky, you can become a little unpredictable. And it is kind of surprising that this didn't come up, or if it did come up, that she didn't view it as a problem. It also makes me suspicious about why his other engagement ended. They're engaged, and then by the next spring, Katie discovered she was pregnant. And she and David decided to buy a house together in Auburn, the town in which Katie grew up. Okay, so now Katie's close to her friends and family again. And guess who didn't like that? David. He wanted her full attention at all times, and he didn't understand why she wanted to be with her friends, especially her male friends, when she could be with him. Okay, the next obvious red flags, he's getting possessive and controlling. And somebody with stalking tendencies is going to reduce your resources. They want to keep you away from friends and family, not only because they possessively want your time, but because they don't want anyone in your ear. They don't want someone being like, Katie, are you sure about this? I know you're pregnant, but he is a drug addict. Or Katie, what happened to his last relationship? Or Katie, he's kind of possessive over you. They want to eliminate those possibilities. So they limit your resources. And then you're the only person they're listening to. And it's a very effective way to control somebody is by limiting their outside world, you become the center of it, and then thereby you gain control. Katie, to her credit, refused to give up her social life, and David became increasingly jealous. This time he was still using, but he refused to go to rehab even after he lost his job. And thus, then he relies on Katie for everything. So now he has nowhere to even go. All he has is Katie. So, of course, he's home. He doesn't want her leaving. She's like a prisoner at this point because, yeah, she can go to work, but he's probably just there looking at his clock, waiting for Katie to return. So basically, David seemed totally okay to let Katie continue to be the breadwinner, and he didn't seem to be in any sort of rush to get a job, and he had no excuse. He had a great education and a great work history in the medical profession, but still he wasn't able to hold down his job, likely because of, you know, his addiction and or personality problems. Katie's father, John, picked up on the trend right away. And of course, a dad's going to be like, wait a minute, you're pregnant, you're working, he's staying at home, and he's addicted to drugs. He wasn't into it. And that was the first thing that struck me. He never seemed to go to work, is what John, Katie's father, said. He would have a nursing job for six months, but then he'd be out of work. And he was perfectly fine with that, just collecting his unemployment. Yeah, I mean, this is red flag central. This is like, she's in too deep now. She's pregnant. Yes, he's not. Prince Charming, but what do you do? It's confirmation bias. You're looking, if you made the decision that this guy's the right one, you're looking for things to confirm that, not refute it. You, that, it's easy to ignore the red flags because not only am I in love and I decided he, he's the one, we own a house together and we're about to have a baby. So you can see, it's like, you know, it's really easy for me to sit in this chair and be like, oh, you should have ran, but she doesn't know what's coming next. And would we run? I'm not so sure I would run. It's humiliating. There's a lot of shame and it's going to be a lot more work for her. Plus, there's always the chance for redemption. And you're going to hang on to that, right? You're going to hope, listen, he wouldn't be the first one who's gotten through an addiction problem and come out fine on the other end. So again, I want to reiterate while I'm saying red flag, red flag, red flag, this is not a reflection on on Katie because, I mean, I'm not sure I would have known to leave. And by all accounts, she's a good person. She's in the nursing field and she's got a million friends and 
She's been, been described as super compassionate, so it makes sense. All right, so in October of 2009, Katie gave birth to a little girl, baby girl, who she named Sydney. And at first, David was a doting father, and Katie was super hopeful that the family life would help motivate him, change for the better, and you can see that. You can imagine that. It's like, okay, now you have this little girl to fight for. Now you're going to get better. You're going to stop being controlling. But sadly, any improvements in David's behavior were very short-lived. Then there came a point when Katie had had enough. Katie soon learned that David had been cheating on her, and that was the final straw for her. She didn't take the decision lightly, but she did kick David out of the house. So she has a limit. She's like, okay, listen, maybe you are an addict and I can help you through that, but we have a family and you're cheating and you're an addict and you're not working and I'm doing everything and you're still controlling. You gotta go, sayonara. She didn't want their daughter to miss out on having a father in her life, of course, so she would continue to invite David over to the house and he would actually watch Sydney whenever Katie had to work. But as you'd expect before long, David started showing up later and later to watch Sydney, and Katie started getting fed up with that because she's got to go to work. So she put up with David's behavior for nearly a year until the fall of 2010 when David was arrested for forging a prescription. That's bad. He ended up getting off with probation, but Katie was officially done. She realized that there was nothing more she could do for him, and she tried to best to move on. Well, at that point, you hope David goes on his own merry way and sees his daughter when he can. But that's triggering for somebody with a stalking tendency, somebody with a controlling personality, somebody who's obsessive. Being cut off can be a, an incredible trigger for them. And that's, that's what happened with David. David's behavior started to escalate and Katie soon started to receive texts from him, alternating between friendly and aggressive. And that is a pattern you see almost across the board. It's like they almost give you a, a glimpse into the spinning hell that is their head, where it's like, I'm gonna try this tactic and it doesn't work, so I'm gonna try this tactic, and they're just throwing stuff at the wall, trying to hope to get your attention, to get you to respond. And you see the madness in the pattern of text messages. It's another red flag. I mean, she knows it's, it's weird and it's probably looking crazy. What she doesn't know is that that's a consistent sign. We see when someone who's escalating and their behavior can sometimes get a lot worse. In some texts, he asked her to get back together with him, and in other texts, he was jealous, accusing her of dating other men. Again, we see that all the time, the whole like, okay, maybe you're not with me right now, but you better not be with somebody else. David became so suspicious that one day while Katie was sitting in her house relaxing, he barged in, stole her phone, and left. Katie called the police, don't know how she did that, but she did somehow call the police who made him return to her house. They ordered him to return the phone, but he denied taking it. She called 911. She did the right thing. One night, while Katie was out of the house with her brother and some friends at a bar, they noticed David's car outside. So he's officially moved to stalking. Katie's brother went outside and confronted David, which of course results in a, a shouting match. So now they're out there yelling at each other. But this again is just going to escalate David's behavior because he's already boundaryless at this point. And now he's thinking, oh, her brother doesn't want her with me. So sometimes I'll even triangulate on somebody else. And that's probably why he was aggressively yelling at him. And another night, Katie went on a casual dinner with, with a friend. And not long after, she learned that David called her date's boss. So this friend, this guy friend, who she went to dinner with, his boss gets a phone call from David to tell him that his employee had been harassing Katie. Basically, he just pinned him his own pre predatory behavior on Katie's date. So he described what he's doing to Katie and said it's this like innocent dates that was doing it to this place of work. And this guy's no job and he's probably on drugs. And so he's probably staying up if he's doing those types of drugs, whatever drugs he's doing, I don't know. But he's got all the time in the world and all of the obsessive features to do it. And he's digging deep. He's already going. And these are all, I mean, these are all bad news. Like, all of this is okay. The guy has no boundaries. Do you know how embarrassing it is to call? Like he has, he must be so brazen and have such moxie to call some stranger and be like, oh, your employee is doing this. So yeah, she's mortified and he, David just gets worse and worse. He then contacted Katie's male friends, spreading nasty rumors and telling them that she was a slut, hoping they would cut off contact with them. Like who's going to take that phone call seriously? Oh, your ex-boyfriend is saying you're a slut. I can't be friends with you anymore. But here's the thing. I think he's at the point now where he's not trying to get her back. He's just making sure no one else has her. I think he's pivoted now knowing that he's, it's, he's not getting her back. He's tried every antic, but now he's like, I cannot live if she's with someone else. And I think 
that might be why he is going ahead with his slut shaming campaign. Then one night after all of that, Katie was putting Sydney to bed and she went downstairs and David jumped out from behind the freaking couch. I can't even, terrifying. It doesn't matter if you recognize that it's your ex, a human just jumped out from behind a couch in your locked house. You lose your mind. And then even after you recognize, okay, I know this person, your body is still in hypervigilant mode. Like your autonomic arousal is through the roof. It can never be normal. That person is just, he's certifiable at this point because normal people don't do that. But guess what? It's, it's worse than that. To her horror, she realized that he had snuck in earlier in the day. He's just hanging out there, hiding, waiting. I mean, that's predatory behavior if I've ever heard of predatory behavior. So of course she kicks him out and changes her locks. But how do you, you can't un, unexperience that. You know now, she's got to know now, this guy's dangerous and everything's escalating. It's linear, and that's, that's the other red flag I want you as listeners to remember. It's linear. They don't go backward. Like, it's as these things are ramping up, you need to know that if they're willing to ramp up, that means they're willing to do more and do more, and they're becoming more emboldened, and violence can be around the corner. Not every time, but when there is violence, it always looks like this from the beginning. Though this behavior was terrifying, Katie decided not to call the police because she didn't want to have her daughter's father in prison. Think about that. She's not just worried about her own well-being. She has to think of Sydney, And she's going to have to answer some big, tough questions to Sydney later. Yes, your daddy's in jail. I mean, he wouldn't have still remained in prison. But if Sydney learns that her dad did get arrested and perhaps did serve some prison time, she has to explain that she's the one who put him there. You know, and so she's taking the long view. Uh, in hindsight, of course, we wish that she had called. But again, it's really easy for all of us to sit here and hear this story and be like, oh, you should have done this. You should have done that. But think about it from her perspective. She doesn't, she doesn't know what's coming. She just knows what she has in front of her. A child, you never want to talk poorly or to paint your child's other parent in a bad light. Because while you're thinking it's justified, that child is half that person if it's his biological child. And they will grow up one day and reflect it. Am I bad too? So you have to, as a parent, be careful with that. Not that this is a parenting podcast, but she felt that if he could just make it through this probation period without getting in further trouble, then he would finally give up on her, which I actually think the probation is probably why he hasn't ramped up even worse. She begged him to leave her alone, but he doubled down. Her neighbors told Katie that they'd seen him going through her trash. And she soon found evidence that he'd broken into her house when she noticed a set of car keys was missing. So that's so creepy. You know, while you're gone, while you're at work, you're creepy stalkers in your house hanging out. She immediately called David and demanded that he bring him over. But when he did, his behavior became even more erratic and strange than it had been. He wasn't wearing a shirt and he was flexing his muscles and bragging loudly to her that whomever she is seeing doesn't have what he has. We've gone to the crazy place. Now, this kind of, that flexing, that puffing out your feathers and, and that kind of just really mammalian weird, I don't know, it's not, it's primal, right? And he's, I don't know if that's the drugs doing that or if he's just gone to the dark side, he's in full-blown stalking behavior. If I, I wish I could tell her, you know, like, okay, you need to protect yourself now because this guy's gone there. But, you know, she's also with him for years. So while David had clearly become unhinged, Katie, at that point, was just relieved to get him to leave without incident. But she did, at that point, recognize the danger of David's behavior. And in fact, she was so disturbed that that night she slept with all the lights on and she realized that she needed to get some real help, that this was beyond her control. Unfortunately, it was too late. The very next evening, Katie was home alone with her daughter and after she tucked Sydney in for the night, she walked out of her room and she was struck over the head by none other than her jealous ex. Tragically, she was still conscious when David put one hand over her throat and another over her nose and mouth. Katie fought hard. She scratched his chest. She struggled to free herself from his grip, but David was too strong, and he ultimately strangled her to death. This leaves their one-year-old alone in the house. He left her there, and he carried her, Katie's body to his car. He drove to a secluded area and he dumped her in a shallow grave off a nature trail that he had dug ahead of time. That isn't premeditation. I don't know what is. What an asshole. I better understand impulsive types of murders. I've been studying my whole life. They're horrifying. 
but we've all gone off the, like, been so mad where you're like, oh, I'm so glad that I don't have a, I mean, not really, but you feel like you could hit someone. You don't because your frontal lobe works so you can control yourself. I don't have sympathy or empathy for those types of murders, but you understand them a little bit or you identify with them a little bit better than you do these predatory, cold blood types of murders. This guy's a stalker. We know he's a predator. But even most stalkers don't plan to kill their victims this far ahead of time. Often they decide, like, if I can't have you, no one will. But to dig the fucking grave. That's the pitfall I fall into all the time. I try to project normal, rational thought on criminally insane people. This man, and that's one thing I want to elucidate for listeners, is that once you are a stalker, once you're full-blown harassing and treating another human like prey, there's no more reason. There's no more logic. This guy willingly orphaned his daughter for all intents and purposes because he knows he's going to jail for the rest of his life if he doesn't kill himself, and he knows that her mom's dead. That level of selfishness could look psychopathic, and maybe it is, but it's consistent across violent stalkers, and it's they don't even think that far ahead. They're so wrapped up in the horror film that is their brain at the moment where they literally, all they're doing is thinking about their victim. They're brushing their teeth. They're taking a shower. Everything they're doing, that is what they're focused on. They, they often forget to eat because they're so hyper-focused on it. So yeah, what he did was really premeditated. He was just in a heightened state of mania. And I don't let him off the hook for it at all because there is plenty of times. He, he does have some functioning capabilities. He wasn't, you know, a stalker his entire life. It sounds like he wasn't a great person. But f- to take it that far, he did not kill her impulsively. He planned it out. So a lot of times I can look at a stalker and be like, okay, this is standard borderline personality disorder behavior. It's so layered when there's drug addiction because you do behave in ways that are out of the norm. They're just, it's, he does that to the most calm, normal people. Do drug addicts usually stalk and kill? No. But for me to, to look at David's particular behavior and be like, aha, I think he's a psychopath or I think he's borderline or I think it's too hard because of the drug addiction. And I find it in all, in any type of predator, I'm always, I want to peel back the layers of the onion, but it's hard. It would be interesting to understand what, who David was before his addiction and we can't get our hands on that. I've certainly looked, but it would be interesting to see. I mean, it's a certain type of person who's willing to steal drugs at their work anyway. So I imagine impulsivity is not something that hasn't been used to describe him before. But this type of, of killing that he did, that was not impulsive. That was predatory. It was premeditated. And it's a, it's a very different type of, of killing. You know, I mean, stalkers sometimes do premeditate because they're like, I don't care what happens. I cannot live on this planet one more day without this person under my control. And he took that all the way. Katie's mother, Tina, realized that David had killed Katie in front of their daughter when the toddler said, Mama fall down the day after her mother's death. Here Katie had been concerned about having her daughter have a father in prison, but David had no concern at all about depriving his daughter of a mother and a father for the rest of her life. In the morning, Katie's neighbor noticed that her dogs had been left out all night. And after getting no answer from Katie, she called the police who found Sydney alone in her crib. I'm glad she called in the morning. I mean, where's the regard for this child, this dad? Like he doesn't even like, he should have done something to it. I'm glad he didn't take the daughter with him, but what if she'd gone for days without being found? They immediately started searching for Katie and in the meantime, quickly zeroed in on David. They called him in for questioning, of course, and he, naturally denies having anything to do with Katie's disappearance, but law enforcement noticed scratches on his face and chest, in addition to his suspicious behavior, which is not surprising. Despite what David may have told himself, he was no criminal mastermind. He actually, unprompted, told police, well, it's not me because I haven't been digging. There's no mud on me. And that's all before Katie's body was found in the shallow grave. So here he goes to all this length to hide her body, and then he basically just rats himself out to the police. He was calculated in his murder, but then totally impulsive and off the cuff when he was questioned. He doesn't seem, he has features of a sociopath or a psychopath insofar as he has no concern for anybody but himself. But stalkers are really selfish and they can be really selfish without being 
a psychopath because they get so stuck in the spiraling vortex that is their thought process at the time. I mean, I've talked to them before, and the way they describe the obsession, they're just literally operating on instinct alone, and they can't undo it. It's a, it's a horrible place. I have no sympathy for them at all. They're some of the most selfish people roaming the planet. But when they describe what they're going through, it's actually horrifying for them too. And I mean, I don't really care because of what this guy did. But it gives you an idea. Listen, we can't, if we don't understand how stalkers work, we can't prevent them or avoid them or treat them. So of course he basically rats himself out. And based on his accidental confession, the police go to the woods and Later that evening, Katie's body was finally discovered. I, I just can't even think about her parents. And, and this is what's really, really messed up. When your daughter is being stalked, all you do as the parents is you go back, think, what if I could have done this? What if I'd done that? What if when I saw this, I did this? The, the hell that is now their heads is horrifying. I have I chills. I wish I could be like, look, in reverse, of course, you're going to look at it that way, but no one knows. I, don't, I mean, we don't have stalking 101 in school. Like, only because I trained in this do I know what to look for next, but I never get these stories before they happen. His most obvious dangerous behavior and the murder were a day apart. I definitely also want to point out that, and we'll see this through the series over and over and over again, it is almost impossible to stop a stalker. Law enforcement used to historically just think of these as like lovers' quarrels and they would do nothing. Now they do. They have a lot more information and education about this, but legislation in a lot of these states is such that you basically have to be injured or dead before the police can do anything. It has to be, it's different. Like California has great anti stalking laws, but it's, it's very state dependent. And it could be that they could be reporting this police and police are like, what am I going to do? Arrest them for calling you? You know, like it's really hard to, so even if they had seen the future and known that he was gonna kill her, there's not much they could have done, not legally. After learning of her death, Katie's family and friends were of course devastated and wanted to see David stand trial. And though police didn't have enough evidence to arrest him from the murder yet, they were able to hold him on unrelated drug charges, the only time where his drug behavior has been useful. Eventually, all evidence pointed to David, especially after he was caught bragging about the murder to fellow inmates in jail. This guy is not a thinker. And he, the details match what the prosecutor's physical evidence was. And this was very upsetting, but I want to share it so that I can show you what an evil bastard David really is. Specifically, he told a fellow inmate that he laughed at the sound Katie's body made as it landed in the muddy hole. And he said to her, Last drinks on me, bitch. He is a bragger. He is a tough guy. Like, he probably gets some, you know, ego stroking from, from telling this story. Or he's trying to position himself in a place of power because of the hierarchy that does exist in the prison system, which is fascinating to me that, like, violent criminals have their own code of ethics and morals. I love studying that as well. But David is just such a crappy person. He's just like, you know, he, he reminds me of, like, a dude on roids, you know, just... I'm muscular and I'm brazen and I steal drugs and I don't care that I left my daughter an orphan. And I mean, the worst thing that she did was leave him for being a bum. I didn't even get any evidence of her sleeping with any other people. I don't know if she didn't. Obviously, she's within her rights to. But it wasn't even like he caught her in bed. You know, there's these triggering moments for stalkers and, and he needed nothing. She left him because he forced her to, you know? And this guy's just, you know, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy, like I've said, for stalkers. But some stalkers are just a lot worse than others. And this guy just sounds like a bad person. And we see that a lot, right? The most suspicious, jealous people are the ones who are doing it themselves. And they're like, if I'm doing it, you're probably doing it. You know, and that's, he's just a, yeah. I mean, he was probably obsessed with the fact that she could be sleeping around. And he's just projecting all of his bad shit onto everyone else. And the selfishness, the degree into which, it, like the degree to, I mean, I know stalkers who literally, they kill them, usually stalkers kill themselves after they kill their victim. It's a murder-suicide. And, and in the media, you'll see, you'll hear murder-suicide, murder-suicide. Dig into those cases, and what you usually find is a stalker. And I wish the media used those terms, because then you understand it's not just a murder-suicide. This person has been a predator, and this was their prey. And they can't live on this planet with them, so they have to kill them in their warped brain. But then they know they're going to jail, so they take their own life, too. And not this guy. 
not this guy. He just wanted to eliminate. He's just punishing her for breaking up with him. And, you know, nobody, he's a king. He gets to, you know, just, I mean, I hate to give it such a nice term like narcissism because that's too nice to describe this guy. He's much sicker than that. But he's just, I just don't even like him as a person. In October 2012, they charged David with Katie's murder. And at the trial, Katie's father, John, kissed his wife on the cheek before taking the stand. He then asked the court to imagine how Katie felt as she fought to live with her daughter so close by. I am haunted by what she must have endured, he said, his voice shaking. Also from the stand, Katie's mother, Tina, spoke directly to David with halting breath. She told David that his three-year-old dreams about and speaks to Mama Katie. And then, twisting a knife that needed to be twisted, she told him, she doesn't even know you exist, Dave. District Attorney John Buttleman said that David decided to kill Katie after discovering she'd been intimate with another man, despite the fact that they'd been broken up for a year. Whether she was or wasn't is inconsequential, but of course he said that because he wants to make it look like he, he had a trigger. He was fixated and jealousy consumed him, Buttleman said. That was the defendant's motive, his true reason for killing her. David argued that romantic jealousy had nothing to do with Katie's death. He denied planning her death without giving specifics. He told the court he witnessed something that made him snap. No, you see what's going on here? He's trying for second degree murder. He's trying to say it was an impulsive type of killing. It wasn't premeditated, thereby it's second degree. But you dug a grave ahead of time. Calling himself a loving parent, David said he pleaded guilty to do the right thing. Five months after being charged with her murder in February 2013, David pleaded guilty to Katie's murder and was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. That's a particularly bad story, but unfortunately we have thousands of them. Stockings, no joke. One out of every 12 women will be stalked during her lifetime, and that's a really conservative estimate. It's actually quite higher. Um, I, I, I've read as many as one out of six. It just all depends on how you define stalking. The one out of 12 is like legit dangerous type of stalking. But, you know, most people, most women, it's far, far more rare for male. And it's like, you know, it goes, it's so primal. Like you're so much bigger and stronger usually than the female you're stalking. And it's like just another thing for us to be worried about and be scared about. Over a million women are stalked annually, and the average duration of stalking behavior is, get this, 1.8 years. To be living in a hypervigilant, fearful state for a, a, more than a year and a half. Do you know what that does to your body? Like, and how do you, do you ever undo that? Does that, like, let's talk victimology a little bit. Like, what do you look like? Who are you after that experience? Because do you trust? Do you, can you undo it? What's the PTSD associated with it? 38% of female victims are stalked by current or former husbands. According to the NVAWS, 81% of women stalked by a present or former intimate partner have been physically assaulted by that person, and 31% of women stalked by an intimate have been sexually assaulted by that person. So you kind of, when you hear about these cases, you get the headline, either it's a murder-suicide, or this person was stalked, or this person was raped, or this person was beaten. Often it's all of it, you know, and you don't, it's like, it, it's so tormenting. It's like living inside of a horror movie. Sometimes just the running away from the bad guy is scarier than the confrontation. 13% of college women were stalked during one six to nine month period, and 80% of those victims knew their stalkers. Great. Those college women are really young. The impact of stalking includes emotional, physical, and financial consequences. Because of the danger and feelings of insecurity and vulnerability, victims of stalking are frequently forced to relocate, change jobs, obtain orders of protection and other security devices and seek counseling. I've seen that so many times. And by the way, that's just geography. I've seen stalkers relocate to continue stalking. Victims of stalking are often prescribed advice that can be very difficult to follow. And I've given that advice and I know it's hard to follow, but there are certain things you have to do to protect yourself. Because Katie was from New York State, and that was also the location of her murder, I'm referencing a stalking guide that was created by the New York State Attorney General's Office. When recommending suggested responses for victims, the guide provides the following advice. Potential victims who suspect they're being stalked should report all incidents to local law enforcement. Early intervention is key. 
evidence collection is an important part of an investigation into a stalking situation. And I might add to that, keep a log. It's much easier. The, listen, the, your local police have a lot of things that they're paying attention to, but if you keep the log for them and present them with the log, it really does give them more flexibility to under to do something and to understand your case. It's legislation, in, as I mentioned, in some states is tough. New York happens to be a good one. Anything, not just when he has sent something rude to you or physically assaulted you, every contact, write it down. Write it down, and it's just, it, it just unties law enforcement's hands a bit to be able to help you. Victims should avoid all contact with a stalker, as any response, even a negative one, may be viewed by the stalker as encouraging. This is particularly important when we get these stalkers who are not mentally well, who are, I mean, you could argue that none of them are mentally well, but actually have psychological, or psychiatric illnesses. And we do get those. They have a relationship in their head that, that does not exist. And they are able to read signs into things that are not there. And these are severe psychiatric illnesses. And particularly with those, you cannot respond, but you cannot respond to anything. And it's so hard. You want to be like, leave me alone. But that fuels the fire. I've seen it over and over and over again. No response is the only response. The guy goes on to suggest that victims make no response to cards, gifts, letters. We already talked about that. Be very aware of your surroundings. Change locks, passwords, and PIN numbers. Create a personalized safety plan. What that means is, who knows about this? Who can you call quickly? Who can get there quickly? Who can be in extra eyes and ears and be aware for you? This is a little far on the list, but I would say it's the most important one. Seek an order of protection, also known as restraining orders or temporary restraining orders. They're really important. Most stalkers avoid them and ignore them. That's not why they're important, because your stalker's probably going to ignore it, but it allows the policeman to arrest him. It allows law enforcement to actually put cuffs on the guy. It makes it much easier. Again, I'm not saying that your stalker won't still do it. Usually they do. But it, and, and it's, it's a kind of a, a double-edged sword because it can infuriate your stalker. Take photographs of damaged property. Again, that all goes in your log. Use a corded phone or pay phone for sensitive conversations. But if you can't, if you have the option of using someone else's phone or a corded phone, go ahead and do that. A burner phone. Get them at Target. They're not expensive. This is an important one because if someone's spending all day and all night obsessing on you, they've probably taken some YouTube courses on how to hack you. So use a safe computer, one at the library, one that belongs to somebody else, maybe at somebody else's house. Because if, you know, if you're making your plans, you don't want the stalker to know about it too. Check cell phone settings for services that will reveal locations and times and turn them off. Turn that feature off immediately. Search for personal information on the internet and contact various agencies to request that this information be kept private. I did this. I had an internet scrub. You have to pay a little bit of money, but... You don't want and you don't want any personal information on the internet. And for the love of God, I know this is hard, but you gotta get rid of your social media. And not just make it private, because these these people are crafty. They're going to make a dummy account, maybe an account that looks just like a friend of yours. They find ways. I've seen it a million times. It it's not worth your life. Just halt social media for a minute. Don't let other people tag you in anything. That's Especially the 13% of college kids, show me the college kids about social media. College children, if you're listening, or college adults, if you're listening to this, if you have a stalker, you've got to become as invisible as you possibly can. And life will allow you to have social media eventually, but it's worth it. Mental illness and stalking and all of sorts of these other things are taught in high school. They should be taught in high school. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, unless you're listening to podcasts, you know, what do you know about it? Or unless you've already been a victim. You know, a listener's point of view, it's like, well, what can you do? And what are the things to protect yourself? And it's, yeah, of course, like change your jogging route. Don't take the same route to work every day. Yes, you can do all of that. But like, maybe you have to become your own detective and get your own information to really protect yourself. So I'd love to end on some silver linings and an update on little Sydney. Katie's daughter, Sydney, was adopted by Katie's parents, Tina and John Sosi and David's family is not involved with her, and that's probably for the best. According to Katie's family, Sydney is the spitting image of her mother in appearance and personality. From her dislike of elevators to always needing her hair combed to fall asleep, Sydney is now about 12 years old. Also, a silly event that would probably make Katie smile, the Sosi Stiletto Stampede, which was created in her honor. It's a 5K run that starts 
with a 50-yard dash in heels, and participants are encouraged to wear silly costumes. The money raised goes toward a nursing school scholarship set up in Katie's honor. There's another important point that I hope we can drive home in this. All stocking legislation changes because somebody got killed. And it's so infuriating, and it has to go state by state by state. It's not until you get a Katie Sosi do you see laws change. So their deaths aren't in vain right. always. I mean, they're, they're tragic and hopefully preventable, but... In most states, I mean, like in California, it was the Rebecca Schaefer case, that actress who was killed by a fan. That's where everyone turned around and changed it. And, and we're slow at it. Like, really, anti-stalking laws should have come into effect when John Lennon was killed. It's a really slow process, but it's people like the families of Katie Sosi and other victims who make it happen. And I really champion that because it's like, it's the worst way to lose a child from a human predator. It feels so stoppable. But if you can save someone else, it doesn't take away any of the pain, but it adds meaning to the life and the death. If you suspect that you are a victim of stalking, text or call the Victim Connect Resource Center at 1-855-4-VICTIM. That's 1-855, the number four, VICTIM, for more information or assistance in locating services that can help you or a loved one during stalking experiences. You can also go to stalkingawareness.org to find more resources, information, and guides to help you deal with this difficult situation. I'm Michelle Ward, and this is The Stalker Right Behind You.